Hi everybody, my name is Nick Kuntz and I'm a neuroradiologist and head and neck imager at Indiana University School of Medicine. And I put together a very brief, very basic uh, video that'll walk you through the steps that are required to take one of your PowerPoint presentations and convert it into a video. And this is something that I think is important because with the current coronavirus pandemic, a lot of medical meetings, a lot of society meetings are being canceled. We're being asked to share our lecture content uh, for virtual meetings. Maybe this is something that you can use in your own training program to create some educational content for your residents and fellows. So I think this is a really valuable skill set to have. And it's a very simple thing to do. If you have any familiarity with uh, PowerPoint, it's, it's pretty intuitive. Um, but there are a few steps that are involved. So what I'm going to do in this video is walk you through the basic steps, what you need to know, uh, and how you can do this successfully. Okay, so first of all, why use PowerPoint? And really it boils down to three reasons. It's something that we've all been using for years in academics. So almost everybody has some basic familiarity with using PowerPoint. On top of that, it's really simple. There are other tools that are out there that you can use to do this very same thing. There's fancier tools for sure, and they're great. I have some of them, I like them, but honestly, it's tough to beat PowerPoint when you're doing something this basic, which is literally taking a presentation you already have made in PowerPoint and just putting an audio line to it and merging it all together and making a video out of it. So I think it's pretty simple. And then lastly, the ubiquity of it. Everybody has PowerPoint. It's something that your home institution, I'm certain, probably has a license for. Um, and so it's just widely available. So for those three reasons, I think it's a really easy tool to use uh, to convert your, your presentations to a video form. So I will start by saying that I'm using Office 365. I think it's version 16 of PowerPoint. I don't actually know. That's not a detail that I really pay attention to, other than to say this is the most current version. You can use prior versions, older versions of PowerPoint to do the same thing. Uh, it works fine, um, but the steps may look a little bit different. It's just, you know, they, every version that comes out, they change it just a little bit. So what you see in this presentation is specific to Office 365. Whenever they update it, it'll change. Um, but it's pretty much the same process uh, regardless of which version you're using. So if it looks a little bit different to you from what you have on your screen, just check and see if there's a newer version that, uh, and, and that may account for the differences. Okay, so what do you need to do this? Well, first of all, kind of a dumb statement, but you need a computer. And you can do this on PC or Mac. I use both kind of interchangeably. Um, so you can use Office on, on either one. Um, and you need a microphone. That's pretty obvious, right? You need something that's going to be your sound input device. Um, and you can use your dictaphone for all the radiologists that are watching. The same dictaphone that you use to dictate at work works just fine for this. Um, if you have a fancier desktop recording microphone, I would recommend using that. You'll get a little bit better sound quality, or maybe to the audio files, you'll get substantially better sound quality. But I do think it's noticeable. Um, but certainly for the purpose of recording a lecture, you can definitely get by with just using your dictation microphone from work. That's not a problem at all. Uh, you will need to have Microsoft PowerPoint software, um, and I would recommend using the most recent version that's at your disposal. Now, the problem that may happen, and, and this is one of those glitchy things that you just have to be aware of, is if you are um, trying to take a prior, uh, older version of PowerPoint and try to try to update it or merge it into a new newer version, uh, specifically if you're if you're um, if you're using uh, videos and things like that, you may have issues. And and actually, the reverse is probably more true. Whenever you're taking something that was done in a newer version and trying to go back and use an older version of it, sometimes it just doesn't like that, and and uh, the videos will fail. So, my recommendation. Use a consistent version that you know works. Try to uh, use the most uh, current version that's at your disposal, and I think that'll avoid a lot of the potential uh, uh, headaches that you may have with this. Okay, so what are the steps to making a video? Well, first of all, you've gotta have your PowerPoint presentation made. I'm not gonna go over those details for this talk, but once you have your, your lecture put together and it's in a form that you're happy with, the same format you'd be giving at a, a national meeting or a noon conference, whatever, then you can make a video with it. So the first thing that I think is incredibly crucial, especially as we're moving more toward virtual meetings and sharing content across institutions, you have to make sure that your presentation is absolutely free of protected health information. This is a really critical thing. I have an entire slide devoted to this toward the end of this talk, but this is critical. It's a step you have to make sure that you take, especially if you're gonna use this content at a national meeting. 
one thing that I think is important is to avoid slide transitions. Uh, they look fancy if you have it fade between slides and all that. That's great. That's fine. But the problem is, if you have it set to do that, your audio line is also going to fade out uh, while that transition occurs. So it's not insurmountable. You can work around it. But keep in mind that if you have a transition between your slides, your sound is going to drop as well. So if you feel like you need to use those transitions, just pause at the beginning, at the end of the slides, make sure you watch the screen fade through to black or whatever uh, fancy transition you're doing, and then begin talking again, because otherwise you're gonna lose whatever you had just said, uh, because it just isn't going to record that. Or it'll record it, but it's gonna drop it out during the, uh, the post-processing, during the, the compiling of your video. Okay, next thing, rehearse. And when you rehearse, do it in that uh, sort of that practice mode that PowerPoint allows for it. When you get done uh, with your rehearsal, it's probably gonna ask you if it wants to save or if you want it to save the timings. When you're rehearsing, don't save those timings because what that's gonna do is that's gonna create an event log and PowerPoint is gonna think that every time you want to uh, play your presentation from that point forward, it's gonna use those timings. So if 30 seconds into the first slide, you click to advance to you know show some animation or a new uh, image pop up, it's gonna hold true and do that uh, whenever you run it next time. It's not permanent. You can take that off. It's simply a, a setting and I'll show you that here in a minute. Um, but whenever you're rehearsing, it's probably wise not to save your timings. Uh, next step, make sure your microphone's plugged in. Okay, kind of a, a silly thing to say, but um, if you haven't already plugged it in, make sure it's plugged in and ready to go. I will say that sometimes, and it sort of depends from computer to computer or workstation to workstation, um, you may have to restart the computer after you plugged in the microphone just because perhaps some of the drivers didn't load correctly. We get that from time to time, particularly uh, with our dictaphone uh, microphones, uh, that if it becomes unplugged and plugged back in, sometimes you do have to restart the computer. So if you don't seem to be getting any sound input, that would be one thing to check and make sure, A, is your microphone plugged in? And B, if it had recently been unplugged, you may have to um, you may have to restart the computer. And then at that point, you should be good to go and record away. And so when you do that, you want to record it in the same sort of manner that you would record or that you would give or deliver uh, the lesson. So um, we're going to talk about how to record in PowerPoint uh, from this point forward. So um, what you'll notice is uh, as you look at sort of that um, that works uh, view within PowerPoint where you're creating your slides. Uh, if you look at the top, there's a top ribbon. That's that banner-like thing that goes across the screen. Um, and on that, you'll notice that there's uh, this little tab that says Slideshow. And you can see that denoted here with my yellow arrow. So click on Slideshow, and that's going to expand it out. It's gonna give you a few more options. See how now you can see underneath that tab, it says Set Up Slideshow, Hide Slide, Rehearse Timings, uh, and record slideshow. One of the key things to make sure of at this point is look and see with those three check boxes, the ones that say play narrations, use timings, and show media controls right there. Make sure all of those are checked. And that's important just so that as you're telling PowerPoint uh, that, that you uh, what you want to do as far as making this presentation, it's going to act basically as just a big stupid event log and it's going to keep track of your narrations and your timings and your audio file that it affiliates with it. So you want to make sure that you're telling it to use all of those things as you create your slideshow. That's what checking those boxes does. Okay, next step, kind of a, a dumb thing I'm going to say it. Make sure you're on your first slide, otherwise you may start recording in the middle of your, uh, of your lecture. Not a big deal, it happens, just back your way out and start over, but make sure you're ready to go in your title slide. And then you're gonna click Record Slideshow. So under that Slideshow tab, you can see uh, there's that uh, box that the yellow arrow is pointing at. It's kind of a box with a little red circle uh, at the bottom right corner of it. You're gonna wanna click that at this point. And that's gonna open up something called Presenter View, um, especially if you're using multiple, uh, a workstation that has multiple monitors, you'll have one monitor that shows your Presenter View. Um, and within presenter view, that's sort of like uh, this simulated version of your presentation and it's what the audience would be seeing and it sort of allows you to have some, uh, some different controls over, uh, over things within your presentation. But um, when you get to that presenter view, you wanna look at the top left-hand corner and you'll see a record button. It's like this red target here. Uh, and you're gonna wanna click that. 
Once you click that, PowerPoint's going to give you a 3 2 1 countdown uh, to let you know when it's going to start recording. So I've done it before. I'll probably do it again. You're all excited about recording. You click the record button, you start talking, and then you realize, oh shoot, it's still counting down. So just take a deep breath, wait till the countdown timer is done, and then you can record. And at that point, you want to deliver your presentation as usual. You want to talk clearly and slowly into your microphone, use your best radio voice, uh, whatever, but deliver it in the same manner that you would if you were giving a talk at a national meeting, at a noon conference, to a small group, whatever you feel most comfortable in, that's the kind of way you want to present this. And then once you're done uh, with your presentation, once you get to that last slide and you're done talking, you're done saying all the things you want to say, keep clicking that left mouse that's going to advance you through all your slides. It's going to go to a black screen, click again, and then you're going to be done. Okay, so just keep clicking through, or if you're using the arrow keys to advance, just keep arrowing through until it's completely gone and it's not showing this recording view anymore. So then at that point, you're done recording. Um, you've made your narrations, and then PowerPoint, sort of as a checkpoint, is going to show you now that you have affiliated an audio file with each slide. So here's a just a look at this uh, at this slide. If you look down at the bottom right hand corner, you can see this icon that looks sort of like a speaker, um, and it has like sound waves coming out of it. That simply denotes that there is now an audio file that's affiliated with that slide. Again, all PowerPoint is is sort of a big stupid event log. You click through your slide, it keeps track of when you clicked it, what popped up on the screen whenever you clicked it, and it just it keeps track of that as a log. All you've done by uh, create, uh, recording this video is to simply put an audio file over it. And so all it's going to do is play through your presentation using those predetermined uh, timings that you've set forth, and it's going to align it perfectly with this audio recording that you just recorded. And so when you compile your video, it just merges all of those things together as a specific file format like an MP4. So let's say you kind of screwed something up as you were recording a slide and, and you didn't like what you said, you didn't like how you, how you said it, and when you get done, you wanted to go in and sort of surgically correct it. The question is, can you do that? And the answer is yes, of course you can. Nothing is set in stone with PowerPoint. You can always uh, revamp things as you go. Um, so you can delete the audio that's affiliated with the current slide or with all of the slides, uh, or you can do the same thing with the timings um, by clicking the bottom of the tab that says record slideshow. So here's again that slideshow tab. Instead of clicking the top where it had that box with the red uh, target circle, um, you just want to click at the bottom of it where it's shaded and says record slideshow where the yellow arrow is pointing. Um, and then it's going to pop up some more drop down tabs. Uh, and one of the things says clear. And so if you hover over the clear, it'll give you options to record timings on all slides or record narrations on all slides uh, or just the current slide as well. So if you want to go in and, and get rid of everything, you can sort of do the nuclear option or if you want to do it as a targeted thing and just get rid of the narrations or timings on one particular slide that you have up in your slide deck, you can do that as well. And then at that point, once you're happy with things, you're ready to compile your video and that's really easy. You go into the file tab on that ribbon and you're going to uh, click file and it's going to pop up uh, a screen that looks a bit like this. It kind of has three broad columns across the screen. Um, you're going to hover your arrow down or your uh, your mouse, drag it down to where it says export and you're going to click on export and then uh, and that's right there. You can see in the yellow arrow under sort of that reddish tab. Click that. It's going to pop up this middle column that gives you several options. You're going to click uh, where the yellow arrow is pointing for create a video. And then to the right of that you can see a third column of, of different features under create a video. Um, and that's where you can change the uh, resolution or the definition of your of your imaging of your imaging of your presentation. Um, and I set mine at full HD 1080p. You can set it even higher. You can set it to ultra high def. I'll caution you against doing that. It's going to make just an ungodly gigantic file size. And frankly, I've had some issues where the it just gets a little glitchy when you do that, where the video and sound doesn't quite merge. So 1080p is definitely good enough for for this sort of thing. It's high definition. Um, it's not such a gigantic file size that it becomes unwieldy. So I would recommend doing full 1080p. Um, the other thing you want to check, sort of your last checkpoint, um, that box is underneath that. Make sure it's selected to say use recorded timings and narrations. Again, just a big dumb event log. That's all this is. 
make sure that's checked and then it will know exactly when to do what. And then at that point, you simply click create video um, where the yellow arrow is pointed, that little box there, click that. Uh, and it'll give you a few options like where do you want to save it to, what file format. I always save mine as MP4s. I upload a lot of video content to YouTube and that's one of the accepted file formats and it's sort of an industry standard. So I would just go ahead and save it as an MP4 file at this point. Uh, and then it'll compile, it'll take a few minutes or it could take you know, 20 or 30 minutes depending on how long your presentation is. Uh, you'll see a little um, like progress bar at the bottom of your screen as it compiles. But, um, and I wouldn't do anything that's real uh, RAM intensive. I wouldn't be watching videos or trying to dictate on packs or anything like that when you're, when you're doing this. Like let the computer have a little space, let it have some air and, and, and just generate this in the background. Okay, so now we've talked about how to make the video. There are a few caveats. Um, that I think are important to, to be stated. And first of all, um, when you're recording, at least with the basic recording functionality in PowerPoint, your cursor or the little arrow thing that drags around the screen when you move your mouse, that's not gonna automatically show up in your video. And that's one of the downsides to doing PowerPoint. It's, I wish that were the case, but it's not true screen capture like you get with some other software. Uh, for that reason, I like to use arrow graphics to judiciously highlight imaging findings. So you can see this very obvious arrow that pops up use something that's gonna really stand out to the audience so they can see what it is you're talking about because you can't just hover your mouse over and say, oh, look at this finding, this subtle lucency. It, it just doesn't show up automatically. Now, that being said, there are some workarounds to this. They're not intuitive, but they're workarounds. So there's something called the laser pointer function. So when you go back to that presentation mode as you're recording your video, that's, here's what it looks like. Here's your presentation mode. If you right click on the screen, it's gonna pop up some boxes. And uh, one of the boxes, as you hover down, you can see there's something that says pointer options. And if you hover over that, it gives you the option for the laser pointer. So I'm gonna do that right now on the screen and you can see what the laser pointer looks like. And that's actually gonna default to staying on. So if you want, you could kick it on at the beginning of your presentation and you can use that. And anywhere you go on the screen, that laser pointer is gonna follow you. Um, it's a little bit challenging as you're trying to advance slides, you sort of have to wand it off to the side of the screen to advance it. But if you wanna highlight something, if you really wanna drive home a point and you don't wanna put an arrow in there, you can use the laser pointer functionality. There's also the pin function and that's under that same tab. So go under pointer options and hover down to pin. And as I switch over to uh, the pin option, it's gonna pop up something that stays on the screen. It's more of an, uh, of an indelible mark. It's not perfectly indelible. You know, you can always delete it later if you want, but that's gonna show up, it's gonna stay on the screen. And you can change the color if you like, you know, make it red and green, I, whatever. But that's an option that you've got. You can also erase it if you'd like. There's a little eraser tab at the bottom of the screen. And then lastly, you have a highlighter function as well. Uh, the highlighter is something that I don't use uh, a lot. In fact, I don't really use much of this a lot, but the highlighter is nice in the sense that if you really just wanna highlight something going on, you can do that. You know, say I wanna highlight the word laser over here or video here, you can do that and it'll save in your video. It's you know not the greatest tool in the world, but it's available in case it's something you wanna do. If you want to do a true screen capture so that you, know, you don't have to do all this right clicking, which is kind of a pain in the butt, it can be done, um, but you can't really do it uh, as easily in, in uh, Microsoft PowerPoint. You have to use fancier software like Camtasia, which is good software. I like to use it, um, but it's you know you have to pay for a license for it, um, and, and it's not as widely available. You can also use Zoom if you want for a true screen capture. Um, Zoom has uh, you know some some downsides as well. It's it's web based, so if your internet crumps on you, then you're going to lose whatever you're working on and um, sometimes you have some video and sound degradation, particularly as the lectures go on. So, you know, you can use those things. You absolutely can. Um, but I like PowerPoint just to, to keep it simple and, and keep it basic. Um, you can, uh, as I said before, you can re-record the audio and timings on individual slides. So if you're not happy about it, you can certainly fix it. Nothing is set in stone until you finally compile that, that video. Um, and then when you get done, make sure to save your presentation. That seems quite intuitive, right? Well, the thing I would say is give it a different name from just the presentation itself because you've now affiliated all these timings and this audio and, and, and stuff to it. Save it as like lecture underscore video version. I don't know, whatever you wanna call it, whatever makes sense to you. The reason being is if you put all of these transitions uh, and, and these event log things, this timing and the audio thing, 
Next time you go to deliver this lecture in real life at a podium, it's going to remember all of those timings. And anytime you put that, uh, like the laser pointer up, it's going to, you know, act like it's possessed and just take over and start doing that. So you can take them off by removing all of the timings and, and, and uh, narration on your slides, not a problem. But if you've got the storage space, I would just store it, save it as a separate copy that you designate as this is my video copy of this lecture. Okay, the last concept to talk about is protected health information. And as I said before, as we're generating videos to use at national meetings for virtual meeting purposes, sharing widely across institutions, you have to be absolutely, absolutely on top of your game and make sure that there's no protected health information uh, within the talk because, you know, that's, that is a huge, huge financial penalty to you and to your home institution, could potentially be grounds for being fired. Uh, if you know, so just you, you potentially can play with fire here and you just have to be very careful and that's all. So how do you do it? Well, basically to make sure that it is PHI safe, all of it needs to be de-identified and it's the same type of HIPAA safe harbor methodology that you use for research. There's 19 different criteria that have to be met. Uh, and this is sort of modified from our internal policy that the legal folks at, at IU School of Medicine and IU Health uh, put together with us in, in the Department of Radiology because we do a lot of outward facing educational content. So um, you need to make sure that these 19 requirements are met. And yes, there's a lot of content on the slide. I didn't split it up amongst multiple slides because I wanted to have it. So if you want, if you were interested, you could do a screenshot and just have it all housed in one location. So I'm going to run through these pretty quickly. Uh, quite intuitive for the most part. There are a couple things that you kind of scratch your head and say, oh, I didn't realize that was the case. But first of all, Obviously, you can't have the patient's name. You can't have any geographic sub subdivisions that are smaller than a state, okay? So you can't say, and this patient from Indianapolis, Indiana. No, that's that's not that's not copacetic. Um, you're not supposed to include dates except for the year. Um, uh, you know, you can say in, in 2018, we had a patient present like this, but you can't say the patient presented on March 1st of 2020. Um, importantly, within that is the fact that for patients older than age 89, you're not supposed to give their age. You can do it for patients younger than that, but patients that are age 90 and above, because there are so few of them, that potentially uh, could get tracked back to them because you know it's there's just not as big of a population. So um, if the patient is elderly like that, just say they're a patient in their 90s and, and you'll be safe. Uh, you can't include telephone numbers, fax numbers, email addresses, social security numbers. I mean, that's all obvious. Um, certainly you don't want to include medical record numbers and that's an easy thing to do if you're not careful because that's oftentimes imprinted on your uh, medical imaging. Uh, you can't have any sort of health policy beneficiary numbers or account numbers as well. Uh, you can't include certificate or license numbers. Here's an interesting one. Vehicle identification numbers. I know that you were all wanting to put VIN numbers for cars in your presentations, but you just can't. Um, for those of you that do procedural stuff, be aware that device identifiers and serial numbers are considered protected health information. Um, if the patient has a specific web um, address, a URL that could point back to them, that cannot be included. Same with an IP address number that might point back to them. Um, you can't include any biometric identifiers, and those are things like fingerprints or voice, uh, voice prints of the patient, which is something that really wouldn't cross our minds in radiology. Uh, but something that could is, uh, you cannot include full face images uh, uh, in terms of pictures of the patient's face without their permission or comparable images. And that's something that's a little bit of a gray area, but you have to keep in mind, some people out there are of the opinion that a scout localizer, potentially in the sort of profiling the patient in a lateral view, you can make out enough facial features that potentially uh, patients could be recognized or they may recognize themselves. So you really need to be cautious with that. That's something that I think perhaps in head and neck radiology, we don't think enough about. Um, and then any other identifying number or characteristic or code. And then lastly, um, any person that's de-identifying that data, they just can't have uh, uh, any reason to believe that any information that they're including uh, alone or with combinations of other data uh, could lead back to identifying the patient. So again, a lot of this is really common sense stuff. There are a few things that kind of come out of left field that you just need to be aware of, particularly the, the patients older than age 90 bit, I think is important as well as the 
um, as well as the obscuring facial features on, on things as simple as like a CT scout image uh, that, you know, some people could, uh, could, could be of the opinion that that could be tracked back to a patient. Okay, so in summary, um, I've sort of walked you through the process of recording a basic video in PowerPoint. I think it's quite simple. You know, there's not much to this, but it does take some practice. And so, you know, watch through this uh, presentation, give it a try, make a brief presentation of, of your own and try to record to it. And, and it, honestly, it's, it's pretty enjoyable. Once you learn how to do this, it, it's not that hard. And I think it's a valuable skill set. Um, you can use your dictating microphone that you use for work. So your dictaphone works just fine for this purpose. It's not going to give you as high a quality uh, sound as, as a recording microphone, but you know, unless you're sitting in a studio recording music, it probably doesn't really matter. Um, again, I want to stress the point that your cursor is not going to automatically show up in your video. So it's important that you insert an arrow graphic uh, to highlight important imaging findings if you don't want to do a bunch of right clicking and toggling on the laser pointer and toggling it off and, and stuff like that. So you can simplify it a lot by just including embedding an image of an arrow to point at salient pathology. And honestly, that's probably better for a lot of reasons. You don't ever know the environment that you're going to give this presentation in the future. Uh, you don't know if you're going to have a mouse at your disposal or if you're just going to be using arrow keys on a, on a keyboard. Um, and so you have to, you have to have a mouse at your disposal if you're, if you're going to be toggling on and off. Uh, the laser pointer and the pin and the highlighter functionality. So in terms of keeping it simple, it may just be best to avoid it altogether. Uh, and then I want to stress, make sure you work the kinks out ahead of time, okay? Go through it a few times, run through it, practice it, um, and ask for help ahead of time if you need it. You're, uh, if you're getting invited to, to submit uh, recorded lectures for virtual meetings, they're going to have pretty strict dead, uh, deadlines to have these turned in by. So just know that it takes some practice. There may be some headaches and kinks that need to be worked out, and so don't wait till the last minute to do it. Uh, there's lots of people out there that are happy to help you uh, with, with this if you have any questions. So uh, just ask around. Okay, well, that sort of wraps things up. Um, you know, I show this image. This is Devil's Garden in, in Utah, just like uh, PowerPoint, the devil's in the details here. Um, but, uh, you know, this can be a fun process. Uh, once you've figured out the steps to doing it and, and how to do it in a, in a pretty quick manner. Um, and I think it's a, a nice tool to be able to have as you're sort of building your own educational content to share with your residents and fellows back home. So thank you for your attention. Thanks for tuning in. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me if you've got my email uh, or uh, you can hit me up on uh, Twitter uh, with a direct message at NA Kuntz. All right. Thanks a bunch. Take care and good luck making your videos.